everybody and welcome back. Today's guest is Graham Phillips, the pharmacist who gave up drugs. And we're going to get more into that during our chat. Graham is a fellow of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and the owner of Manor Pharmacies, a multi award winning community pharmacy group based in the south of England. Graham is also the founder of Pro Longevity, a podcast and YouTube channel which looks into the lifestyle issues at the root of our modern health problems. And with Graham's knowledge and experience, he helps us to navigate our way through the choppy waters of modern nutrition by promoting real food as being the right way to eat for health so we can live better for longer. Graham is also a trustee of PHC UK, a registered charity dedicated to improving public health and saving the NHS money at the same time through better lifestyle choices. Graham, welcome to my channel and thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me today. Uh, no, thanks for having me. I'm, I look forward to the conversation. Brilliant, brilliant. So just to begin with, I'd just like you to explain what you mean by the pharmacist who gave up drugs. So are you anti-medication? So long story short, the world's getting fatter and sicker and more diabetic by the day. We all know that. No health professionals have any real training in sleep, nutrition or exercise, which I believe to be the root causes. All of our training is identification of symptoms and suppression of the symptoms with drugs. And my own personal journey was a fat kid who became a fat adult, who became a fatter and hungrier adult as time went by and followed all the guidelines. I never got to the diabetes. I probably reached the pre-diabetes stage. But I just realized that I'm spooning more and more tablets into people. Drugs bills going up every day. You could say, well, don't knock it, it's a living, if you were cynical. And despite everything that I did and all the awards that we won, so my, I was very senior in my profession, won every pharmacy award most than twice. Ultimately, it was just it wasn't a satisfying career because for all the awards and all the accolades and for all I was making a reasonable living, I didn't feel I was doing much good. Mm. And what spiked my interest, particularly in all of this, was um, that original Horizon program by Michael Mosley, Eat Fast and Live Longer. And at that point, I was I don't know, 15 kilos overweight. And felt pretty miserable and i remember the hung i remember like i'd be starving for breakfast and when i'd finished breakfast i'd be hungrier than when i started <laughs> you have to stop and i'd be looking forward for lunch all the all the time and at the end of lunchtime, i was almost hungrier than when i you know and that was my life and every so often if i ran like hell and starved myself like crazy i could lose some weight but I could never sustain it. And I saw this Horizon program and I thought, well, I can do that. And it was basically the 5-2 diet. So two days of eating 500 calories, eat normally the rest of the time. And I lost 10 kilos very quickly. And I thought, well, based on my knowledge of science and calories in, calories out, the maths don't work. So there's something wrong with our paradigm. And at a very similar time, I stumbled across David Unwin, Sam Felsom, the beginnings of what became the public health collaboration. And I realized that we've all been lied to, basically. We've been, health professionals are given all of the right science, but not the right outcome. We kind of end up in a blind alley, alley around symptoms and drugs. We're not taught root causes. And I talk about, for my own personal journey, the escape from the tyranny of food. So now I can go 24 hours without eating and I'm not hungry instead of being hungry all the time. And I can choose when to eat and when not to eat. And that gnawing hunger that was with me permanently is all gone. So I'm not part of any cult. And to say I'm anti-drugs in all circumstances would be being part of a cult, an anti-drug cult, and I'm not. Without doubt, 
drugs benefit people the right drugs in the right circumstances used appropriately no doubt of it evidence base is strong that's not the same as saying everyone needs a statin or an antidepressant yeah and i would argue that the over that although statins have a small benefit in a specific group of people overwhelmingly for most people statins do more harm than good mm. And even if you take the best case scenario for statins based on the published evidence, and we can have a whole debate about whether published evidence is all of the evidence or just some of it, but let's just go from the published evidence and the best case scenario. And the best case scenario is if you've had a primary event, in other words, you've had a stroke or a heart attack, and you take your statin diligently, the net benefit in terms of extended life expectancy not five years, not five months, but five days. So all of that, all of those drugs, all of that expense, all of those costs to get five days of, of extra life. Now, you might take the view that five days of life is great. I want to have those five. But if you then thought, OK, so that's the maximum benefit. What's the downside there? Is, uh, pretty much universal agreement that it causes muscle harms. It's pro-diabetogenic. In other yes. words, it makes you diabetic. Mm. And it's a reasonable amount of evidence, I would argue, is that it has an effect on your cognition. So you're leading to cognitive decline. Mm. So even in the best case scenario, you might or might not decide that it's worth taking the drug to get five days of benefit. But the point would be that you should be making an informed choice. And uh, if that choice is, yes, I definitely want to take the medication because I think the benefits outweigh the disbenefits, that's fine. But that's not how self systems work. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it sounds like possibly what is happening is that symptoms are being treated rather than getting to the root causes of why somebody has a particular illness. But I, I always wonder what we can do about that because um, you know, somebody goes to university wanting to become a doctor and they're they're and they're taught they're they're taught at, at university to deal with the symptoms. So you almost think, well, you've got to go right back to, to the very start, really, haven't you? To the start of someone's um, you know. Uh, lifetime in medicine whether they're going to be a doctor or a nurse or whatever it, it might be and you've got to change things there what what do you think about that I think that's right so I want to see so I was part of creating something called healthy living pharmacy and healthy living pharmacy is does what it says on the tin pretty much and pharmacies have been healthy living pharmacies have been hugely effect, effective in smoking cessation uh and um sexual health so we're good at it and it's interesting that when women are given the choice of where they want to access emergency contraception overwhelmingly they choose the pharmacy mm. and that movement started in portsmouth and portsmouth is an area of very high health inequality and we know that in areas of high health inequality, there's always a shortage of, of resources, medical resources in particular. And we call it the inverse care law. In other words, those who need the most care get the least. Mm. What's interesting about pharmacy is it uniquely defies the inverse care law. So in those areas where health need is highest, there's almost invariably a pharmacy. So I want to see my profession repurposed to not to stop giving people medication and getting the best from drugs which is always going to be a core function for pharmacy it's our unique skill as health professionals but to be taught root causes i mean you know we know don't we that the, the root cause of most but not all lung cancer is smoking right if you could explain and we also know that all health professionals, health professionals usually are extremely bright people. Yes, sure. Once you expose health professionals to the truth, and particularly if you paid them accordingly, so the trouble at the moment is I broadly make my living, majority of my living comes from dispensing prescriptions. 
none of my living comes from not dispensing prescriptions. And so I have got not only no business interest in reducing the number of prescriptions, all my business interest would be in increasing the number of prescriptions. But it doesn't have to be that way. No. Pharmacists were paid to de-prescribe. We're actually very good at it. So the NHS itself recommends, this is just one example, the NHS itself recognises and I think it's a huge underestimate, but let's go with it. The, the official view of the NHS is that oh, there is about 10% over prescribing. Mm. Right now, you and I might think it's more like 60 or 70%, yes. but let's go with the 10%. That 10%, so the drugs bill is 20 billion, so that's 2 billion. So why would you not say, okay, pharmacist, we'll pay you a billion quid to reduce the amount of over prescribing mm. and we'll we'll invest another billion pound that we've saved in something else. Yes. So you've got health professionals with incredible knowledge, incredible skills, and it's really a question of switching us back on. So it, it's repurposing, but you haven't got to start from scratch in that we've learned endocrinology, we've learned cell biology, we understand the fundamental science of mitochondria the electron transport chain whatever you want to pick it doesn't take that much to sort of it's a bit like a wind up doll you know you wind it up and just send it off in another direction it will yeah it won't take that much to repurpose the professions but until we do mm. we will continue to get all the wrong advice because we all give the wrong advice that we're told to give by the vested interests of big food who basically write the advice for that of course Yes. I mean, I think that sounds like a brilliant idea. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely in, inspired idea. And I wish that that, that that could happen. And I think pharmacies, um, pharmacists are perfectly placed because you know your local neighbourhood far more than your doctor does. You know the people, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be coming in and out of the pharmacies, not just for the prescriptions, but for all sorts of things. So you do get to know the local people, don't you? I and mean, so talks. I had a pharmacy for many years in the village of Wheathampton, which I, which I don't have anymore, but I still, it's not far. And I used to give talks and, you know, I'd, so you get to know people really well, generation by generation. I'd say, you know, I know the name of the villagers. I know the name of their grandchildren. I know the name of the dogs. Exactly. And, I know, and I know the size, size of their hemorrhoid. <laughs> so that, you know, if you know that, you can imagine what. So um, the statistics are that in UK pharmacy, there's two million daily health related consultations. So that's two million opportunities to see an influence. And that's actually more influence, more opportunities than the rest of the health system put together. So the amount of daily contact we have with people is huge. Yeah. And also, yeah. when was the last time you went to see your, and I'm not knocking GPs, but last time, how, when did you last go to your doctor and say, I come to see you, doc, because I'm feeling really well? Yeah. <laughs> right? It doesn't happen, but the point yeah. is that, Community pharmacies are stitched into the fab everyday fabric yeah. of people's lives in, in that kind of way. They are. So I, I think it's a massive opportunity. You've just got to give us a bit more education and pay us to do those things instead of other things. Yes, yes. And, and I think also, you know, that, that whole concept could be rolled out to doctors as well, surely. So, you know, we'll pay, you know, the NHS will pay you money to, um, you know, to not prescribe <laughs> tablets, but but to find some other lifestyle um, option for patients to to leave the the surgery with. I mean, surely that would be a much better idea. Well, if you if you follow any, um, I've had David on one of my podcasts. We've discussed it. Any of his interviews, that's exactly what he says. Yeah. Which is, most health professionals, and I, I go to all these events and have cardiovascular medicine, and they say. At the beginning, they'll be talking about the latest drug, right? Whatever the latest innovation is. And they'll say, of course, health style, uh, lifestyle. And they'll discuss it for about 20 seconds. And then basically the remaining 90 minutes is all about the latest drug and how to get the best out of it. Because lifestyle doesn't work. Why does lifestyle lifestyle doesn't, doesn't pay. <laughs> oh. it, it, 
so lifestyle doesn't work because no health practitioners have got any training mm. in what lifestyle changes need to be made and how to support people so of course lifestyle doesn't work so of course we'll give everyone we go because that works um i th i can't remember who originated this but you know once you start practicing in this different way you, once you see it you can't un unsee it and once you switch a health practitioner on unless they're completely corrupt and most of us are not most of us are our morale has been destroyed by the system and we all feel pretty frustrated because we all started out trying to do the right thing and you know the results disappoint us once you switch people on to this it's impossible to go back to the old way of practicing mm. so i'm overwhelmingly optimistic that these this paradigm can be shifted and hence my commitment to the public health collaboration because i think that is the kind of mechanism <clears throat> that we can see there. yeah yeah brilliant yeah no i mean i just think it's uh it's such a a good idea and you know i i think that people are far i think over the last few years particularly people have become more used to going into their pharmacies to you know ask oh can you just have a look at this spot that i've got on the back of my hand or something like that so so it so it wouldn't be a great leap for people um you know, to go to their pharmacies and to get more knowledge about better lifestyle choices. Yeah, as I say, it's, it's already in our contract, but it's a very small percentage of our contract and getting smaller by the day. Yeah. So, you know, Wigobi is a, well, come on to Wigobi, I'm sure, but Wigobi yes. is a much bigger thing for us than any of this other stuff. Yeah. It's not our fault. It's not because we're necessarily corrupt or evil. No, it, of course not. The way the system works yes. and all we're doing is operating the, the NHS guidelines in the way that the NHS instructs us and pays us to do so. Yes. So we've got to make that change at the top mm. because to give you another context, so the UK, the total UK NHS bill is about £175 billion. Pounds. The net benefit of that 175 billion pounds is two two years, I think three months of end of life care, basically. The drugs budget is about 20 billion. Mm. The budget for all the country's GPs is about 10 billion. And the budget for pharmacy is less than three. So would it's not a very difficult calculation to say, okay, if we were to top slice the NHS budget, one well, say three percent, and invest that in pharmacy, mm. what could the, if that would double the income for pharmacy? What could it do for the rest of the system? Yeah. What would the return on in investment be? Yeah, and 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 surely it wouldn't be beyond a stretch to take one area and just trial that within a particular area, and then see if it works, and then you can roll it out over the country. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, it's all been trialed. I mean, I was doing smoking cessation before the NHS ever provided it. And that was the start of the model. Yeah. So to the extent that community pharmacies, and I, I'm not saying this is the competition or that we're better than other parts of the system. All of us, there's plenty of work for all of us. So this isn't, don't, I don't want this to be misread as like attacking GPs. It's absolutely mm. not. Hmm. it's more about what we could all do working collectively together so yeah. that business model of pharmacy's ability to have an effect on public health hmm. and outcomes no one's doubting that hmm. no one is building on it either because the whole nhs thinking just isn't along the right paradigm yeah exactly yeah. i mean you know i always say to people if you want to lose weight which most people do if the best thing to do, the best way to begin is to keep an open mind because the way to lose weight is not how we've been taught. And 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 I do think that for a lot of maybe like senior doctors who maybe have been working within the NHS for many, many years, having an open mind, keeping an open mind as to what actually could work would be a really big step forward for everybody. I think you're so right about the open mind. Um, challenging the paradigm of calories in, calories out. 
medicine's very hierarchical and challenging that paradigm is a bit like challenging gravity. Uh, you've almost got to be a flat earther. <laughs> and I've got, a, in fact, a, one of my clients from this morning, we just went through his chronometer results. Um, he's doing incredibly well. He's highly motivated and we've done lots of things for him. But we were looking through his calories and he's got a really healthy diet. Um, his diabetes has gone down. His blood pressure has gone down. Everything's really good. He's, according to chronometer, he's consuming 3,000 calories and burning 2,500. So we should be putting on weight every week, right? But he's lost I don't know, 20 kilos. No figure. Brilliant. Yeah. So those calories, I mean, the body has no receptor for calories. The body does a calorie. So the definition of a calorie is the amount of energy required to warm one degree of water, one mil of water through one degree centigrade. And that's physical. And that's absolutely true. So that's what a calorie is. But that's based on um, physics in a closed system. Exactly. We're not a closed system. We're not no. physics or biology. Yeah. So this whole calorie thing doesn't work. No. Yeah. No. I, yeah, so I, I agree. Is basically to bring, is to avoid the foods that make you hungry and fat mm. and make your insulin and then let your body do what it's supposed to do. Yes, exactly. And and yet we, we, we seem to be, or I would say like mainstream seems to be a lot, of, very much closed to that idea because they just won't seem to let the calories in and calories out thing drop <laughs> and just consider that something else might might work better. And I think there are now so many people around the world who have change their health outcomes through eating just eating real food not not putting a particular name onto it but just eating real food has changed their health outcomes and a lot of them have gone back to the doctors and have said look you know this is what's happened to me just through changing the food that I'm eating and can you take me off these medications now it's interesting so one of the things that we know is that people don't like taking medication Hmm. and even people who've had heart transplants and lung transplants and kidney transplants a lot of them don't take the medications they're not very compliant we also know because there's something called the new medicine service that when people are prescribed a new medication and the new one is usually the most expensive 10 percent of people never take the first dose wow in three months, 30 or 40 percent have stopped it altogether. So we've got this huge drug bill, but no outcome. So we need to think of a better way. That's yes, that's yeah, cool. definitely, definitely. So 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 just having touched on metabolic, physical metabolic health or bodily metabolic health for a moment, I want to move over to food and mental health because I think that is the new sort of up, upcoming um um way of thinking really isn't it in in as much as you know um how how food can change our health outcomes well actually food can change our mental health outcomes as well so can you just talk a little bit yeah about Some of that quite, quite technical but um for anyone that wants to look in further into this i cannot but uh recommend chris palmer's book brain energy and he's done a series of fantastic interviews on, on YouTube. I would start with the Diet Doctor ones and end with uh, the Andrew Huberman. The Huberman one's about three hours. I wouldn't start there, but <laughs> uh, there you go. Um, well, one of my favorite quotes is one from Georgia Reed, who's also a metabolic psychiatrist. And she said, last time I looked, the brain was connected to the body. Yes. I think medicine hasn't worked that out. So the brain is seen as separate when it's not. The evidence is that there's a bi-directional relationship between diabetes and poor mental health. Right. And we know that people with higher levels of mental health, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, by and large, they don't die of their mental health disorder directly. 
they die of the consequences of their diabetes. And I always talk about diabetes as a gateway disease. So by and large, diabetes on its own doesn't kill you. It's the metabolic dysfunction that kills you. So I talk about diabetes as, as the kind of gateway disease to the three major killer diseases. So the cardiovascular disease, heart attacks and strokes broadly, the neurodegenerative disorder. So the one we all talk about is Alzheimer's, but the fastest growing is, is uh, Parkinson's disease and of course, cancer. And what we know is all these things, if you've got, if you've got one of those things, you've got much greater likelihood of having the others mm. so if you're diabetic you're more likely to have poor mental health and if you've got poor mental health guess what you're more likely to be diabetic yeah and when you look at what's going on on the level of the cell you realize that the bullet in the end it hinges on a bit like if you put petrol in a diesel car it doesn't run very well yeah and if we fuel our bodies with the wrong fuel, your metabolism, your metabolism starts to fail. And specifically, the metabolism is the, the mitochondria. So the, the battery of the cell, if you're right, the bit that generates the energy of the, of the cell um, that makes it able to run and sustain life are the mitochondria. Mm. And cells have somewhere between 400 and 4,000 mitochondria. And if you Google mitochondria on Wikipedia, you'll find that they don't just generate energy. They basically run the cell. They organize the cell, they run the cell. So by taking in the wrong fuel, causing your mitochondria to misfire, you disrupt the running of your cell. And of course, you're, by disrupting the running of the individual cell, in the end, you damage the entire organism. Yes, of course. So it might play out as cancer, it might play out as cardiovascular disease, or it might play out as as the ability, inability of the brain to use energy in, mm. in the right way. Yes. When the brain can't use energy in the right normal way, you might get hyperreactive cells, for example, epilepsy, mania, schizophrenia, or you might get hyporeactive cells, for example, depression. And what's the difference? What's the difference between the hypo and the hyper? Can you explain? So the hyper that? is excess reaction, overreaction. So in, in epilepsy, your 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 brain cells, you know, fire indiscriminately. Right. Okay. And in depression, nothing works very well. It's all very sluggish. Mm -hmm. And people who have diabetes tend to like behave like couch, couch potatoes. Yeah. Because they feel like that, they're demotivated, they're depressed, and everything's an effort. Yes, yes, and I think the the important point to make here is this can take years and years and years to happen. So it's not like somebody notices somebody's got loads of energy one day, and then the next day they haven't got any energy. So they go to the doctor saying, "Oh, all of a sudden, I haven't got." This is something that takes years to happen. So it's so it because it happens over such a long period of time, it just maybe seems like a normal slide into older age perhaps it creeps up on you i always say the journey towards diabetes is a, probably a 20-year journey yes. and get off that negative <coughs> treadmill or whatever metaphor you want to use pretty much at any point what i would say is the sooner you get off it the sooner you'll feel fit and well and happy mm, yeah. the, longer, the longer your life expectancy will be Yes, yes. And I have mentioned to people before <laughs> about, you know, the when the Dr. Palmer's dog uh, book uh, came came out, I don't know what I said, Dr. Palmer's book um, came out. And, um, you know, when I've mentioned this to people, they will not accept that there is a link between the food we eat and mental health problems they just won't they just just won't accept it at all it's not an easy thing to accept i mean i for many years i've had a really good understanding of cardiometabolic health in other words how the things i described how what causes diabetes and how that leads to these other problems it's only in the last really 12 months that i've really understood 
properly how that affects mental health yeah and it is a different and more difficult concept to grasp but i know for years people would say oh my diabetes is better my psoriasis has gone my weight has gone off i feel less inflamed but i just feel better within myself more energetic just more motivated and I never complete. I, I I had lots of clients report that to me, but I never completely understood it. But I do now. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and certainly a lot of people who maybe haven't uh, haven't got the mental health issues, but they might have, um, you know, some other issues like pre diabetes or something like that. One of the first things that seems to go when they move over to eating real food is this brain fog. So uh, for anybody who has got brain fog, eating real food can get rid of that in a very short space of time. Absolutely, because once your brain is using energy in the way that it's designed to do, mm. once the inflammation, because once you remember when you've got systemic inflammation, the brain's inflamed as well. Yes, yes, quite. And that can, uh, in less than a month, you can usually improve all of those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, so, and it's and, and it's normal, of course, for the body to experience um, some kind of inflammation at some times. If you fell over and grazed your knee, then that's a normal part of the inflammation process. But what we're talking about here is the chronic inflammation that's going on for years and years and years that the body just, it's almost overwhelms the body, doesn't it? Exactly that. So as you rightly say, the inflammatory response is normal and we die without it. So, you know, if you get thumped or you fall over or you break a leg or you get an infection, the the inflammatory response is part and part of the body's natural defense mechanisms. But in, inflammation is supposed to be acute and short lived. The trouble with our kind of standard Western diet is that you're chronically inflamed long term. Mm. It's, you know, you could look at cell biology and say, well, the link between these killer diseases is the inflammation because we're not designed to be permanently inflamed. No. Exactly, exactly. So, 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 just that sort of moves me on, sort of, onto the next topic I want to discuss, which is almost a sort of an overlap onto this one, which is ultra processed foods. Um, so, I, I, I think you know, where, where are we standing at the moment with ultra processed foods? Because there's been a few books that have been brought out in recent years which have tried to highlight or which have highlighted the problems with ultra processed foods. But I don't see any less of those when I go into the supermarket. And so, I mean, do we have a good understanding as to what an ultra processed food is? Yeah, so we should start by defining what we mean by ultra processed mm. because um many foods that are perfectly healthy and natural and safe and have been used for millennia are processed ultra processed so i got this from asim actually i learned this from asim mahotra and he always said forget the sort of marketing bullshit on the front turn the pack over when you take it off the shelf and if there's five or more names on the back of the pack some of which you've never heard on heard of put it back yeah. So that's my working definition of ultra processed food. So if you look at the back of the, nor the front, if you look at the back in the pack, and there are some names you've never heard of that will probably be, you know, emulsifiers and ad additives and antioxidants and stuff, names just that, that look like a chemical chemistry experiment, not a food. So if you go and buy broccoli, there's nothing on the back. It's just broccoli. Yes, exactly. If you go and buy steak. It's just steak. Yeah. There is nothing on the back. No. Right. Go and buy some Krispy Kreme donuts. That's what there's probably like 50 ingredients. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally, <laughs> with the, back of the pack looks like a chemistry set. Yes. Put it back on the shelf. Yes. Yes. So that's my kind of easy way of looking at it. Um, so, and there's various aspects of this. One is they are purposes designed. My favorite example is Doritos. I love Doritos. 
and I can eat a sack full. If I was sitting here and I had some Doritos, I'd be eating them without even realizing it, loving them. And I can eat a sack full of Doritos. And at the end of that sack full, I'm hungrier than when I started. Yeah. And these foods are created in food laboratories to be that. So there's something called the bliss point. And it's that perfect combination of sugar, salt and fat that gives you the maximum dopamine spike. Mm -hmm. And so they are ultra palatable, highly addictive foods that spike your dopamine. And just like any other form of addiction, the more you have, the more you need and enough is never enough. So interestingly enough, most forms of addiction are recognized in the international classification of diseases. So alcohol addiction, smoking addiction, sex addiction, gambling addiction, all exist. But there's no such thing as food addiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I know that there's every such thing as food addiction. But officially, food addiction doesn't exist mm -hmm. because if you could, if, if I could stand up publicly and say, it's official. Most of the ultra processed foods we're eating, most of the big brand foods that are run by these huge American companies are, are addictive and designed to be so. Mm. That would suit their business plan. No, of course not. And I'm sure a lot of people would find it hard to believe. A lot of people would find it hard to believe that food manufacturers spend millions of pounds stroke dollars a year in creating foods that get to that bliss point they would people would just think well it's a you know it's just one of those things i just pick up this pack of doritos and i can't stop eating it that doesn't mean to say that might happen with the next pack no 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 but, but a lot of people would argue that that point i think whereas in actual fact the you know they, they've been very carefully created haven't they to for for, for people to find it very hard to stop eating them and Ooh, and also yeah. i have I have read books as well where essentially it said if you have been used to eating this particular food and you've had that dopamine spike even if you're not eating that particular food if you see somebody else eating it you're going to get that dopamine spike just it's by incredible. watching somebody else eating that food that's incredible that they that there's that kind of control over people no, that's right. So, you know, you get people who've been alcoholic and who are, they go for 10 years without a drink. And then, and they walk past this pub every day for 10 years. And one day they find themselves in the pub and they've drunk many pints or many shorts. And they don't even, rec they can't even understand how they got from walking past this pub to in the pub to the first drink, to the first 10 drinks. Yeah. And it's all got to do with neural programming and how your neural pathways work. Yeah. yeah. And the answer is, so we don't say to an alcoholic, look, for heaven's sake, just have a glass of wine and where's the problem? Right? No one would say that. No. And you wouldn't say someone who is a 60 a day smoker, what's the problem? Just have one and where's the problem? You'll, you'll be fine. Yeah, exactly. But that's exactly what we say because the, yeah. the point is no one needs to drink and no one needs to smoke but everyone needs to eat mm. so i think it's by far the most intractable form yes. of addiction yes yes and, and and i think also it does have this crossover into politics i think because there are so many of the food companies the pharmacy companies who seem to sponsor political parties that you know <laughs> you do you do wonder why it is that any government who tries to bring in changes just can't seem to be able to to do it or at the end of the day they just get so watered down they're just pointless Absolutely. So um, I've done quite a lot of lobbying for my profession. I've been to all the party conferences at different times. And I remember coming away from the Tory party <laughs> conference and they have all these stands. And there were two huge stands either end of the hall. One stand was Philip Morris Tobacco. And at the other end of the stand was Tate and Lyle Sugar. Tate and Lyle. Yeah. Yeah. No figure. I oh, know. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. It's It's just, but I think a lot of people are just, just not aware of this they're just I mean I, I know I keep saying this on almost every single video that I do but um 
you know, there was a time when I walked into a supermarket genuinely believing that everything that was for sale in the supermarket must be okay for me, or at least must wouldn't be bad for me, because otherwise, why would it be being sold? Yep. I genuinely believed that. I didn't think I had to have a filter when I went into a supermarket, because you just assume that if it's up for sale, that someone's passed it as being okay. Because it won't kill you quickly, it'll kill you slowly. It'll kill you very slowly. This is the this is the problem. Yeah, yeah. This it this is this is the problem. And and I think the other argument that people bring in a lot of the time these days, just going back to what you were saying at the very start of this particular topic, um, was how, you know, most foods these days are in some way processed. Um, you know, I mean you can argue that, you know, some uh, meat that has gone through a meat meat well meat processing plant exactly um, as is processed even though what i'm looking at when i'm buying it from the butchers or the supermarket is is some beef mince so so you no know, so you can say that that has been in its own way processed but i think what we're talking about here is foods that have either you know never seen a blade of grass never seen the light of day or have at one point been foods but everything that would classify them as being a food has been stripped out and they've been put back together in a certain way with other added ingredients that no longer make it a real food so so i think the importance of looking at the back of a packet as you said is is you know it's just crucial crucial for us all really isn't it i, I call them sometimes food like substances <laughs> and sometimes i call them poisons with added calories yes, yes. Not, one thing they're not is nutrition and i think no. we need to contradistinguish between nutrition and calories because they're not the same no, they're definitely not the same. And also, I just think the words that we use around food as well, things, I mean, I hate the word treats because treats is normally, okay, if you're going to apply it to a strawberry, fine, fair enough. But if you're going to apply it to, you know, a cake or a cream cake or something that is ultra processed, that's not a treat. So just call it out for what it is, you know, a, a, a plate of cellular damage, you know, just say it for what it is rather than using this this word treat well i go to all these professional nhs conferences in in and around and you know you get halfway through the meeting and they serve orange juice <laughs> and chocolate croissants and i stand up and say have we all got shares in type 2 diabetes yeah yeah and they know now that i'm going to say it so they might still have that food around, but they've usually have, have some real food as well because they've just got sick of me giving them hell yes, about it. Good. And I'm, I'm glad that you do. Yeah, yeah, you've got to. You've definitely yeah. got to. I mean, I was outraged, you know, couldn't believe it a few years ago. There was a uh, something on Twitter whereby the, the, the staff had worked through the night and, um, you, know, at, you know, as a treat, the management were giving, buying them all pizzas how is that how is that of any use i wrote a blog um so at the end during the covid crisis crispy cream donuts out of the kindness of their hearts delivered free crispy cream cream donuts to the staff as they came off the covid wards <sighs> and i likened it to what the cigarette industry did to the American soldiers so as they came back from the Second World War, the cigarette industry gave them free cigarettes. Yes. Out of the goodness of their hearts, obviously not for any ultra mm. ulterior addictive mo motive. <laughs> yeah, same thing. No exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 it is. It's just, it is. It's terrible. It is really terrible. And so, so you know, have, have we found, can we say that there is a link between poor metabolic heart health and ultra processed foods can we say that there is a link there um not only can we can say it but we can prove it so you can look at how these high sugar um foods damage cell metabolism damage the, the glycocalyx which lines the uh arter arteries damage your mitochondria um, glycate your proteins, et cetera, and cause inflammation. I mean, that's that's not 
like no one argues that that's not the case the science is well proven and we can equally show how the seed oils which are the other things that we don't talk about enough so it's not just the sugar it's the seed oils rapeseed grapeseed canola etc etc damage cell function damage your cell membranes damage your mitochondria so i call it i call it the trifecta of evil uh, sugar processed carbs and seed oils that are in these ultra processed foods so we can say it and we can justify it on the basis of the science and we can justify the science also on the basis of the epidemiology so it all comes together it's very well proven yes yes i don't think there's any doubt about the facts but i always give this example that in i think 1994 the chief executives of the big uh, the five chief executives of the big tobacco appeared in front of a senate committee in not, and you can find it on youtube not in 1944 not in 1964 but i think 1994 and all five chief executives swore on the basis of their best understanding of the science that there is no link between smoking and lung cancer <laughs> And they'd known the truth for 40 years. Yeah. And, you know, as I was quite key, ple pleased to hear, see what Rishi Sunak had to say the other day about reducing the availability of cigarettes and smoking. Yeah. But it's a bit late, Rishi. That yeah. needed to be sorted 40 years ago. That is no longer what's killing people. No. It's McDonald's and the rest of it that's killing people now. Yes. And they're not tackling that at all not not yeah i agree and and like you say i think i think the seed oils the more i hear about these seed oils and and let's they, they're called vegetables i mean they, they, they they've never seen a vegetable they are and you know i defy anybody to get hold of one of these seeds and try and crush it and try and get any kind of oil out of it you just can't do it but the more i read and hear about the seed oils the more terrifying i think that they are i mean it looks like they're highly combustible for a start yep. they're terrible for the mitochondria that they're, they're, they're just terrible for the for the whole body and they seem to have a very long if you like shelf life within the human body as well don't they they do so I always say to clients that if you have a sugar spike it's probably going to be gone in two or three hours it ain't healthy but it's short-lived mm -hmm. the point about the seed oils is that they accumulate in your adipose tissue in your fat and with each repetition that you take in more and more accumulate so it's a sort of long-term toxin a bit like smoking one cigarette doesn't kill you you've got to smoke for 20 or 30 years for it to kill you and when they build up it takes many many years for all that adipose all, all the fat stored in your adipose to be recycled and they're saying at least three years maybe five years to rid yourself of it wow yeah. that's terrifying it's absolutely mm -hmm. terrifying yeah. and, and and i think that you know the evidence that now seems to be coming out is like we were talking about before the mitochondria can be overwhelmed and that is what seems to be happening isn't it if it you know if i've got it, the gist right of it it does destroy the mitochondria but it also destroys the cell membranes i think robert lustig mm -hmm. puts it really well that um you know when you blow up a party balloon and then it goes flat when you try it and blow it up again it just goes pop right it, it's, it's lost its elasticity mm. and that's what we do to our cell membranes with these mm. with a combination probably of the glycation due to the sugar <clears throat> yes. damage done due to the seed oils yes yeah. yes and, and i think i think also and something that dr lustig does talk about as well is the dangers of fructose so you know one apple might be okay i personally wouldn't eat i've not eaten fruit in many many years but you know one apple isn't going to kill you but if you have drink one of those cartons of apple juice the, the it again it the body's overwhelmed because it's simply not used to um you know having that volume of fructose to try to try and deal with it absolutely yeah yeah um 
Yeah, so, yeah. so, so it's, it sort of brings me on to, you know, the one of the issues I wanted to discuss, which is, you know, how do we live in a modern world when on a cellular level, our cells, our mitochondria, whatever you want to call it, want to be living back in caveman times? How, how do we how do we try and balance those two? Yeah, I mean, broadly, I would say get decent sleep move around a bit and basically eat real food so ignore those things in the supermarket around the periphery of the supermarket with all yeah. these complex ingredients and just focus focus on individual foods and i think it's a whole generation now have forgotten what cooking is and they've forgotten what food is they Definitely. think food comes in a, in a wrapper yeah. yeah and goes in a microwave yes and they've forgotten cooking skills, the basic yes. ability to assemble a meal. And when you've never learned to cook, it's actually very frightening. Mm. You feel scared of it. Yeah. And, and maybe that's something that schools need to look at. Maybe, you know, cookery skills should be, um, sh you know, all school children should have to take cookery lessons up to the age of, I don't know, 16 or 17. I mean, I Where think... The, yeah. Jamie right. Oliver's right about all that. Yes. Yeah. And we've Definitely. got to stop ultra processed food. I mean, you go, where's the worst food that you can find? It's in our schools and in our hospitals. Yes, it is. Listen there's no that. doubt about that. Yeah. 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 There's there's no doubt about that. It's it's very scary when you think about that. And I think that the one thing that terrifies me is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I mean, this is something that we see a rise of. And again, going back to Dr. Robert Lustig, um, I mean, he talks about over in the States about having to treat children as young as eight or nine with non-alcoholic. I mean, what? <laughs> it, it's, it's just, I, I find it inconceivable um, that we've allowed or anybody has allowed what we eat to get to the point at which children at the age of eight are having to have liver transplants yeah well it starts of course the worst thing that we can do is feed um baby milk mm. right so it's full of highly available sugars and all formulated with seed oils to give it a long shelf life yes you've got children out there most vulnerable and you're feeding them metabolic poisons right yes. from Earth, potentially yes so obviously i'm not here to guilt trip anyone not all women are able to breastfeed but if you possibly can do that and then ignore all the weaning foods and just give them proper food but it's yeah, i think it's you know it, it again it comes back to the options that we're given in a supermarket doesn't it so it really comes back to what food manufacturers are producing and calling it food because it's not whether it's for an infant or whether it's for an adult it's not food yeah i i, I think two things on that however bad you think it is here i've just come back from the states mm. 10 times worse so really? broadly we consume about 55 percent of our calories as ultra processed food and they're about 65 percent right with teenagers it's like 80 plus percent mm. I also think, though, that supermarkets all respond to consumer demand. Yes. The will. demand for real food goes up and the demand for ultra processed food goes down. Mm. Just change their stocks accordingly. So yes. it can, you know, there's no particular reason. You know, that's where the profit comes from. Mm. The ultra processed foods, but it's not inherently so. Just like to say, if you paid the pharmacist to not dispense more than dispensing medication you mm. can change the paradigm if you you know if we're all trained <clears throat> you know around lifestyle and nutrition rather than the use of drugs mm. it, all these paradigms can be changed and i kind of feel it's a domino effect i suppose i, yeah. I mean i mean I, I look at something like that and i think it's it's kind of like getting on to the london eye I mean, when I got when I went to the London Eye, I expected it to stop, but it doesn't. So it just carries on moving and you just you just have to step on at some point. So I just feel like, you know, with you explaining it like that, it's sort of like, you know, at, 
at what point do you step on you know where 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 do you start yeah yeah uh, that's why i think the phc is so important because yeah. i think we have this i believe that we need a social movement for change because the system isn't going to change unless there's pressure on the system to change and the vested interests of big food and big farmer aren't going to change because that's where their income comes from Exactly. But the consumers can make that change. Yeah. And the consumers can force politicians to make that change. And you know, if you went back 50, 60 years, what Rishi's just done with smoking would probably have been opposed by the libertarians. And now everyone's busy thinking it's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> you could do the same with the food. Yeah, that's yeah, true. So so you've mentioned PHC UK a couple of times now. So I know you're a trustee. Can you explain to us what PHC UK is and what it does? Yeah. So it was a collaboration, a small collaboration of people who discovered the truth. I think mainly originally driven by health professionals. And low carb GP, uh, David Unwin, he tweets as low carb GP and he says it used to be a very lonely low carb GP because he's the only one. So I think a group of health professionals who si simultaneously uh, and maybe serendipitously discovered the truth started to come together and wanted to support each other. And then I was lucky because I met all these people at a fairly early stage and I got involved from about 2017. So in order to create a social movement for change, we created a charity called the Public Health Collaboration. And I would encourage everyone to go and have a look at their website because there's tons of resources, all of it free. We don't charge for anything. And I like it for a variety of reasons. One is I think it's fundamentally doing good. I found the support and camaraderie that we've all had by supporting each other has helped me on my own personal health journey and my professional journey. I feel that we're doing some good for the country. And I like the fact it's not hierarchical. So it's not like, well, I'm a doctor, so I know more than you and you just have to listen to what I've got to say. It recognizes that all our we're all equal as human beings and our voices are all equal. So there's no hierarchy. Mm. And I like the culture, so I give a lot of my own time. I'm paid to support this charity for all of those reasons. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think it's a wonderful organisation created by really well, you know, intentioned people. Um, and if you're not involved, get involved. You'll be welcomed with open arms at whatever level you feel that you can support it. Absolutely. And um, that there's that it has a conference every year, doesn't it? That's open open to the general public. Yeah, so all of our conference videos, you can go back and look at all the videos on our website for free. Yeah. We are at the advanced planning stage already for our next conference will be held in May in London. We haven't quite nailed down where in London and the exact dates, but keep an eye on the website and come and join us. Absolutely, yes, yes. Good idea. Yeah, brilliant. Good. Um. So just um, thinking about maybe people who have heard that message and they're thinking to themselves, you know what, well, I'm taking all these tablets and I want to try the real food. So maybe they want to go to their GP to say that they want to reduce their tablets. How would somebody go about beginning talking to their GP yeah. about that? Um, so... The, the first, I think the first place to go is the Public Health Collaboration website, because there's so much free evidence based resources there. Mm. Um, and you can learn. What I would absolutely not do is to stop your meds, because that yes. would be irresponsible. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be done sensibly and responsibly. So, first of all, empower yourself, get some knowledge. And then find something that matters to you, whatever area it might be. And go and see your family doctor or your GP practice or your local pharmacist and raise something specific with them. Um, challenge them constructively. Because actually, generally speaking, health professionals, if they're challenging a constructive 
empathic way because they're human beings like the rest of us believe it or not um will respond accordingly if you went to your doctor and said look i'm smoking and i want to come off your doctor would not say forget it mm. you went to your doctor and said look i'm worried about my alcohol consumption will you help me they're not going to say get lost and I think I would pry to frame the conversation in those terms. And I want you to support me and work with me. Yeah. Not all health professionals would do that. I'd be the first to admit it. And the answer is now find yourself another health professional. Yeah. If your GP or pharmacist or whoever it is doesn't respond appropriately, take your checkbook elsewhere. Yes. Because in yes. the end, our income comes from people who bring us prescriptions the people who are registered with us as um for our practices yeah. and if we start to hemorrhage patients and clients we'll pay a financial price and quite right too yeah yes so, so just that thinking challenged constructively i would say yes yes definitely and as you say if you go onto the phc uk website there's an awful lot of resources there that you can just have a have a bit of a read through and begin um people can begin to start to find out more about um particularly the issues with metabolic health and just sort of going on from there so um you know, people might not know what illnesses come under that umbrella of metabolic health. So could you just um, perhaps explain what those particular illnesses are? Well, broadly, it's everything. Right. So if you go back 120 years ago, as I said, there was essentially uh, um, the first heart attack in the entire world's medical literature. I might have the date slightly wrong, but it won't be far out. I think it was 1908. And this, when this was presented at a medical gathering, no one was bothered because there was only one. Why would you be interested in one heart attack? And so in 100 to 120 years, something that was literally unknown in the world's medical literature is now the single largest killer. And so we've seen this growth of cardiovascular disease, broadly heart attacks and strokes, cancer again, virtually not completely unknown but broadly vanishingly small in number and all of the neurodegenerative disorders the dementia the parkinson's and associated with that, that all of those all the so-called autoimmune disorders so you can pick your autoimmune disorder of of choice really ms type 1 diabetes asthma all brand new all man-made diseases that we never encountered 120 years ago in any significant number, but you and don't find in hunter-gatherer tribes. Right. So it's more or less everything that's killing us now. And and would you put fibromyalgia under uh, that same heading of autoimmune yeah. issues yeah. as well? Yeah. Yes. Um, one of my team, uh, Simon, had very severe fibromyalgia, and it's a bit of a woo-woo non-diagnosis. Yes. Anyway, she went carnivore for a month and solved it for herself. Yeah. That's incredible, isn't it? It's just incredible. Yeah. And it just shows the power of eating real food. <laughs> yep. And it's just like mental health as well. So it's yeah. pretty much the thing. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, so really it is most of the modern illnesses. Yeah that we're regularly taking medications for are something that could be altered with a change of lifestyle. So, you know, anybody who is thinking about maybe they want to look into that to reduce their tablets, to, to, to get out of the cycle that they find themselves in of this illness, um, they can go onto the PHC UK website, they can start to read up about um, you know how they can move forwards they can have discussions as you say with their pharmacist with their GP and begin to look at ways in which they can introduce real foods and begin to decrease their medications under of course as you rightly say um, you know their GP because it's very important as you rightly said before that nobody should just stop taking medications that's very dangerous yeah. yeah. And if people need a more detailed help, then I'm happy to help. Obviously, my services are is a private service, but 
where people are, are really struggling with the health and they need a bit more of a health professional input, then yes. uh, 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 contact me. Yes, yes, brilliant. And, and I think also because I, I, I don't, I don't know if, if you mentioned high, high blood pressure because that's also seems to be something that a lot of people seem to have these days. Yeah, so, so we've all been taught, haven't we, that high blood pressure is caused by being overweight and eating too much salt. Yes. Neither of those things are true. Those are both associations. Right. So what drives blood pressure primarily, albeit not exclusively, is raised insulin. Right. Uh, raised blood pressure by a variety of different mechanisms, which I won't go into now. Mm. Okay. Well, if you've got sugar in your diet, you raise your insulin because your insulin is trying to reduce the, is to control your blood sugar. And if you keep chucking more and more sugar into your system, either as sugar or as carbs, your body responds by producing ever more insulin. Yeah. And as your insulin goes up, your blood pressure goes up with it. Right. And that's why when people join my program, one of the first things we have to be really careful of is that their blood pressure then goes too low because they're still taking all the antihypertensive medication. Uh, of course. Their insulin comes down. Mm. Their blood pressure can normalize within days, certainly weeks. Mm. If they carry on taking their antihypertensives, they have massive low blood pressure. Right. That's not good either. No. So buy yourself a blood pressure monitor and just keep an eye on it. Yes, yes. Brilliant. Yeah, good. Really good. So just turning the moment to somebody, for, for, for somebody who's watching or listening, who maybe wants to have a go at keto, maybe they're not on any tablets, but they know that maybe they're pre-diabetic or they suspect that they might be, they might have some kind of underlying autoimmune or health conditions. So, um, and I know to begin with, when I first went keto, this, this is many years ago now, but people, and they still do, bandy around this word, word ketoacidosis. So, just to lay that to rest can you explain to people that well, the difference is between keto and ketoacidosis and why one is good for us and the other one is not so good for us so ketoacidosis is what kills you when you've got type type 1 diabetes and at that point you literally catabolize all your muscle and all your fat and, can, and produce a huge level of ketones. So the level of ketones in nutritional ketosis, the healthy version, will be five or less. In ketoacidosis, it's 10 times more. And at that point, the body lo loses its ability to regulate its acid-base balance. So this whole thing about acid and alkaline, which is normally very tightly controlled. Right. And when that goes out of control, out of whack, that is life-threatening. Right, right. And diabetic ketoacidosis is what kills people with type 1 diabetes. But remember, mm. they can't make any insulin. Right. So if you were type 1 diabetes, you would know about it. You would, yes. Or you probably would. Right. And if you're not sure, then you need to seek some advice. Right. Okay. Generally, okay. Gen generally those things come on very quickly and they're pretty unmistakable. Right. OK. So right. ketone, keto. So we would also be careful because keto can be just like everything else. That Here's my worry that keto is very popular mm. and the food industry will just hijack it like it does everything else. Yeah. So I always talk about a well formulated keto diet, not just a keto diet. Exactly. Yes. Because probably if you just eat seed oils and crap, mm -hmm. as long as they're low sugar seed oils and crap, you'll mm -hmm. be in ketosis. Yeah. But it's still not healthy. But it's still very un unhealthy for yeah. you. Yes, yeah. of course. So it needs to be a well formulated diet. So made from natural foods with so broadly speaking, you have to reduce your sugar, which allows your insulin to come down. Mm -hmm. Mm. allows you to burn your body fat which yes. is what it's yes and that's how people can access their stored body yeah. fat yeah so yeah. we're kind of dual fueled machines we can either burn sugar or we can burn fat yeah. the trouble is most of us are burning sugar all the time we lose the ability to burn fat yeah and and that's the experiment we've all been in for the last 50 or 60 years, which hasn't worked. Yeah. So we need to get out of that and we need to start 
um, start allowing our body to burn fat again. So then it's about reducing the amount of carbs and sugar in your diet. Yes. And increasing, and you say you replace those missing carbs and sugars with fat and protein. Yes, yes. Broadly speaking, less than 50 grams a day of, of sugar and carbs yes. will allow your insulin to come down far enough to allow you to go into ketosis. Yes. The fact that you've been storing for the last 20 years that's sitting there. Well, the, the other point I would make is that babies in utero are in ketosis, mm. breastfed babies are in ketosis. I think that's our natural state. I'm not saying that we shouldn't ever have carbs. I'm sure that we can. Mm. And so long as your metabolism is healthy, you can cope with a certain amount of carbs. Yes. So I eat carbs, not huge amounts all the time, but I, I'm not frightened. Of, you know, If I go to a really nice restaurant, they've got some artisan bread, I'll enjoy it. Mm. And every so often I will still eat a sweet dessert maybe once or twice a year. So it's not like, I'm, no. like I would never eat Never, it. yes. My yes. metabolism can cope. Yes. And, and so it might be a good idea for people to, if they know they're not diabetic or if they suspect they're not diabetic, it might be worth their while just going to their doctors and asking to have a healthy woman test or a healthy man test just to get to see what, what, what their numbers are and then they will have a better idea. Yeah, it's worth knowing your numbers. It's worth, particularly worthwhile, not that I think it's a great test, but the HbA1c is kind of the test that people use. Okay, and that and that's a test that shows what your levels have been like over the last two to three months, as opposed to the fasting glucose test. Yeah. But also, you can always, you know, you can, anyone can go to Amazon and buy a glucometer for twenty quid and do a finger prick. Yes, and of course. Pretty good insight on its own. Yeah. Yes, good, good. Yes, of course. Yeah, and 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 then just moving on to the ne one, you know, the next macro. Just thinking about protein. I know a lot of people. We've been conditioned into thinking that protein, particularly red meat, is bad for us. So, what are your thoughts on on that particular topic? Yeah. So there is no evidence, and never was any evidence that red meat bad for you, and. If you look at our hunter-gatherer ancestors, that's kind of what we ate. Yes. What's interesting, if you look at the hunter-gatherer tribes, the lean cuts that we paid this fortune for, the fillet steak, mm -hmm. with no fat in, they feed that to the dogs. That's the least valuable. Yes. And actually, it's the fatty cuts of meat, and particularly the offal, mm -hmm. that are the most treasured, because that's where the majority of the nutrition is. Yes. So there is no reasonable doubt about any of that mm. i don't think mm. just based on evolutionary biology mm. I, I was listening yeah. to a bbc world service over the last couple of days and there was a such an incredibly interesting um program about this chap i can't remember his name that might have been michael keen i think and he's basically gone from one side of greenland to the other living an ancestral life for those two to three months and he ate nothing but meat everything he ate he caught um and he didn't eat any vegetation it was just meat and then um at the end of the time when he flew back to the UK he went to see Tim Spector at um at Imperial College London who basically did his pre-Greenland tests and his post-Greenland tests and he was actually healthier <laughs> even though you know he'd he'd probably I mean he might have eaten less but you know he'd he'd only eaten protein essentially for the last two or three months and yet he was healthier than he was before he actually started i mean i think protein and fat is still up for debate the right balance and i think it's not one thing so there is no it's got to be this much protein and that much mm, fat mm, no, uh, no i think it's individual and that's where you have to have an individual negotiation and see where you are yes there are arguments for and against protein and fat and it mm. all depends on where you are on your journey and what you're trying to achieve of course um, and, and, and I think for a lot of people, it comes down to ha how you feel. So it's not always about, you know, the weight or whatever it might be. It's, it's how you feel. If you feel brilliant, then whatever you're eating, if it's incredibly high protein and slightly lower fat or the other way around, then then that's, that's what, what your body needs. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty much invariably found together in nature, which tells yeah. you something. 
Yes, exactly. And the the egg, I think, just being the perfect superfood, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. So so just sort of thinking about wrapping this up now. Um, so if somebody perhaps wanted to um, maybe think about cutting something out or reducing something from their diet, what do you, can you share with us what you believe is the very worst food to eat and that they should yeah. try at all costs to cut out of their diet? Yeah, so I tend to go stepwise. So the way our approach is everyone gets a continual blood glucose monitor. So we can see where their worst sugar spikes are. So we start with that meal. Mm. So I would say start with your worst meal, which for many people is breakfast. So if it says Kellogg's in it or Nestle <laughs> on it. Yeah. So, and then, so pick the one, it, it's the same thing I used to say with cigarettes, right? If someone was smoking there are two ways to deal with smoking cessation. One is to stop cold turkey and the other one is to cut down to quit. And neither is absolutely right. They both have their mm. place. Mm. So you pick the meal that you think is the one that you can change most easily and just substitute real food for the fake food that you've been eating. Yeah. And you'll feel better. Yes, yes. And you'll feel less inclined to snack. And, and and if somebody was just beginning that, if they were going on that stepwise, for instance, program, they were just thinking, right, so from now on, whatever I was eating, I'm going to make out of real food ingredients. How long do you think they have to be doing that for before they begin to start to feel better? Well, I normally see results within two weeks. Right. Um, and people say, yeah, you're right, Graham. I, I was feeling so awful and I was feeling hungry all the time. And I just feel better and I feel a lot less hungry. Yes. So my process is I get people to start eating real food and get off the fake food. Mm. And I get them to stop the snacks. So they go from three fake food meals a day plus two snacks in between mm. to three real food meals a day yeah then i get them to have a period where they're eating in a period where they're not eating so more or less 12 hours from the last thing in the evening to first thing in the morning so there's 12 hours of not eating and 12 hours of eating so you've got time restricted feeding yes and then i'll often say are you equally hungry for every meal and they'll say actually i've never like me i've never been hungry for breakfast we'll stop <laughs> breakfast yeah. So now you're kind of doing 16 hours of not eating and yes. eight hours. Eating. Eight hours in, in yeah. eating in an eight hour window. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, 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 I th and I think it's incredible when somebody moves over to that 16, eight, how much better they can feel. Yeah. And over that period, generally everything starts to feel better quite quickly. And then you build from there. So, yeah, so it, it really all begins with someone's shopping list, really, doesn't it? So it all begins with somebody planning, yep. like, what, what would I have had on, on Monday night? Right, so instead of that, these are the foods that I'm, that I'm going to be buying when I go to the supermarket or to the shop. Yeah, it does require a bit of planning. At the beginning, yeah. it's very frustrating and a little bit scary because you think, oh, crumbs is like nothing I can eat. Mm. Yeah. And then you go through a period of discovery and in the end you think crumbs. Actually, all these things I was frightened to eat, like eggs, I can only eat one egg a week because it's going to give me cholesterol. And red meat that's going to kill me. I, and I <laughs> remember the first time I put full fat milk in my tea, I waited for the heart attack. <laughs> I'm still waiting. <laughs> You then discover that actually all the things you've been frightened of were fine and you're just not hungry and you feel great. Yeah, exactly. That's absolutely fantastic. And I think that is a good, really good, positive note to end on. So I just want to say, Graham, thank you so, so much. You've just shared so much knowledge and information. It's just been a mine of information here. It's It's been brilliant and I can't thank you enough. That's thank you so much. It's been Thanks really lovely you. to chat with you. So I'll speak to you soon. Okay. Bye now. Yes. Bye. <laughs>
Thank you.